And if you have a Bible, you can open to Mark chapter 10 as we prepare to study the word a bit as we worship God through studying the scriptures. And if you're new here, uh, that's really our heart is that you would get to know God one day at a time in your own Bible. And uh, by the way, if you're new here, is, if this is your first time, can you just wave at me real quick? Is your very first time to church? Anybody? First time. First time, come on. First timer. I love it, I love it. Cap, can you do me a favor? The lady right behind you is first time. That's pretty daring. Thank you for being here. Second row. What's your name? What's your name? Alyssa. Everybody say, what's up, Alyssa? I love it. Uh, that's groceries on God right there. So we're trying to support our local supermarket next door that we hang out with from time to time. And they're so gracious to allow us to park overflow. All of our staff parks in, in their supermarket parking lot. And so I don't know if there's five bucks on there or 500 bucks, if I'm honest with you. So I don't know. Nonetheless, it's just a simple gift to from God through us to you. Thanks for being with us. Again, our heart is that you would experience God's best. Today, Mark chapter 10. How many have been reading along with us in our Bible and four year journey? It's been our dream to just, you know, I came to Christ in a radical way and some guy challenged me to read through the Bible in a year, not in four years, in one year, in 2001. And I'm not, I wasn't a big reading guy. I, that time I was playing football, I could catch, you know, I could catch a six route, but I wasn't all that great at reading. But after practice, every day I took the challenge and it changed my life, every, every facet of my life. And so my desire for you, not as a religious routine, but as an opportunity to get to know Jesus, what God's best is for you, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, apply it in your life and in your families, so that's, that's really the heart behind it. Today though, Mark chapter 10, I wanted to, before I get into our text, I just wanted to communicate my heart before I begin this message. And uh, if you could really tune in right now and those listening online, I hope you hear my heart. Today I'm gonna deal with a very sensitive subject. Part of the beauty of going through the, the entire Bible is you, you go to some really tough situations and some tough scripture. And our heart at this church is to never water down the word of God, but to always do it with grace and truth. And in that order, by the way, Jesus was full of grace and truth. And so specifically, if you've gone through a divorce, if you're in the middle of one, if you grew up, in a family that was divorced, that went through some tough stuff. I, I just want, I wanna request humbly that you wouldn't feel condemned. You wouldn't leave right now. I pray that you would embrace what God's word says and, and know that we serve a God of grace and mercy and second chances. So wherever you're at in the spectrum, can we agree before I even get into this? Are we okay with that? Okay. Well, let me pray and let's, let's launch. And again, let's see what God would speak to us today. God, what a, what a privilege and honor for us. <laughs> we could just worship you all day in here. It's so good, so beautiful to be with you and so many others here with hearts of gratitude. God, wow, that you would save us. Jesus, that you would go to the cross and you would take the penalty on that cross that I deserved, brutally murdered for all the choices I've made that have been out of line, misrepresented you. I'm the chief of sinners, God, and I thank you for your grace. And I thank you for your word. It is our game plan of life is your love letter. It is absolute truth. And so we wanna align ourselves under the authority of your scripture today. And I just simply wanna decrease and allow your spirit to increase 
and to speak to every heart tuning in online here in this auditorium. I really, really, my, my heart, God, is, is your best for every single person here. Would you speak in a powerful way, in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Well, if I was the enemy of the human soul, my whole goal to steal, kill, and to destroy, I think I would know how to, to go at you. I would attack marriage. Why? If, if I, the enemy of your soul, could dismantle your marriage, I could dismantle your family. If I could destroy your family, I could destroy the city. If I could des destroy the city, I could destroy a nation. If I could destroy the nation, I could destroy the world. And it's no wonder then that our marriages are under attack. I was doing just some research and I was looking at just different stats. And as I was studying, there was a, a historian from Harvard in the mid 1900s and he predicted the downfall of our country and the reason he said would be through divorce. In 1910, there, the stats were 10% of marriages ended in divorce in 1910. By 1948, 25% of marriages ended in divorce. And you and I both know the stats right now, about 50% of marriages end in divorce currently in our country. As of five years ago, one divorce happens every 36 seconds. That's 2,400 per day, 16,800 per week. And the average marriage that ends in divorce lasts eight years. Now, I would just venture to say most of us in this auditorium and listening online have been affected in one way or another through divorce. And, and I'm just gonna share with you, this is very personal to me. And this is not, I've talked to my parents about it. I've forgiven my parents. My parents... And I'll, I'll tell you in a minute all the amazing stuff that has happened even through divorce. Anybody? Come on, somebody. The grace of God. But I will just be very honest with you because I'm communicating to a variety of, of, of various group of people. Some of you right now are actually contemplating divorce. And so I just wanted to share, I wanted to go back as a youngster and just share just a couple things that how I was affected. I wet my bed as a seven and eight, nine, 10 year old. I couldn't go spend the night at people's house because I was scared. I grew up very insecure. You wanna have secure kids, have a phenomenal marriage. And again, I'm not throwing salt on my parents, I'm just trying to be honest. As God is giving me this microphone, I'm trying to help people today. This, this really hit me, man. I was, I was studying this and I wanna give you this scripture and before I even give it to you, I wanna give you the heart behind it. In Malachi chapter two, I'm gonna read this for you and I'm gonna tell you before I even read it, God hates, check this out, God hates divorce. Here's the key though. He doesn't hate you if you've gone through a divorce. Can I read it to you? Because I'm just trying to give you what God says on this, this issue. Malachi chapter two, verse 14. Check it out. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. Young and in love. Hey. <laughs> Do you remember that? But you've been unfaithful to her. Though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one? Everybody say one. one. Didn't he make you one with your wife? In body and in spirit, you are his. And what does he want? This hit me. What does he want? Godly children from your union. So listen to his command. So guard your heart. Every man in the building, just put your hand over your heart. This is what the enemy is trying to attack right now. Guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. Verse 16, this is what I just quoted. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. By the way, did you know that God hates all sin? Doesn't matter what sin it is. I, I've heard, I love this term. 
He hates the sin and loves the sinner. He hates divorce. He loves people that have, have tragically gone through that or made that decision or have, have been affected by that. He loves you with all of his heart. He says to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So what did he, and then he says it again. What does he say? So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. I mentioned to you just a couple of the effects as, as a child. One of those effects was bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness for many years. And a variety of years ago, I had a conversation specifically with my father, and I just had to ask for forgiveness for the resentment I held in my heart. And we had one of the most beautiful conversations where my dad forgave me. We talked about how it takes two to tango. We worked through some stuff. And can I tell you, I have zero bitterness towards my father to this day. Zero. Why did I wanna say that? Because some of you in here are still holding on to the bitterness of your parents' divorce and God came to set you free. If he's forgiven you for a million sins in your life, there is no reason why we cannot forgive as hard as it might be. You got the forgiver in you, he can forgive through you. Just wanted to, just to share that. The other thing I wanted to say is this. Man, it's so cool. The, that, that old verse, Romans 8, 28, don't you like that? God's working, What? All things together for the good of those who love God. Even a divorce? Yeah. I've seen, like, I, I honor my parents. So both my parents got remarried pretty, pretty soon after. And they're both married to this day to those, to those spouses. And I'm telling you, the, the model that they've made for me, specifically giving their heart to the Lord. I look at my stepdad and my mom and I'm like, dude, I would not be here today without their example, their love, and their support in my life. My, my stepdad, dude, like that dude is a workaholic, man. That dude is just faithful and consistent. And I honor the Lord and what he's done, even through a dicey season, because I'm not gonna like go ahead and just like go past that. There is pain, there's anguish that happens from that, but God is good. Someone say, God is good. All the time, and all through the whole thing, he had a plan to put it all together for his good. Now, some of you are asking the question, should I get a divorce? Is it okay for me to get a divorce? You're asking that. In fact, I would tell you, over the two decades of ministry that we've been serving, it's been one of the hardest questions that we've had to work with people through because it's so nuanced. It's so nuanced. It's wild what happens. Um, but what I thought I would do today is because you read it in Mark 10, I thought we would just see what Jesus would say about it. Wouldn't that be a good idea? All right. All right. Well, let's read about it. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse one. Jesus left Capernaum, went down to the region of Judea and into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him and as usual, he was teaching them. Love it, don't you love it? Jesus always teaching. Some Pharisees, <laughs> and if you're new to the Bible, these Pharisees, man, they kept on tripping, like chasing Jesus around, trying to get him all trapped up, right? Some of the Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife. Now pause there real quick, because I, <laughs> in my opinion, they're not looking for answers, they're looking for arguments. And by the way, Christian, when people ask you questions, I would challenge you to, just to discern the spirit behind the question. I've wasted so many years of my life answering questions where people didn't want the answer, they wanted to have an argument. And as I've matured over the years, I've in love said, hey, I appreciate that, man, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass on the debate. When I sense it's a genuine heart behind it, I'll take as much time as you want. Be careful what discussions you get into. These guys are trying to trap him. And really, number one, they're trying to get him in a political trap. If you are familiar, if you've been with us the last few weeks, remember in Chapter six, the message I was talking about when King Herod took John the Baptist's head off. Do you guys remember why that whole thing happened? 
Because Her- 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 Herod's wife, Herodias, was mad because John the Baptist said it was unlawful for you to divorce your, your other wife and go marry this chick. So number one, they're trying to trip Jesus up by saying, yeah, dude, it's unlawful. So they could have Herod come and try to do the same thing to Jesus. They're trying to trap him. But I love Jesus. Isn't he said, Jesus is, man, Jesus is a Jedi, dude. He's like a Jedi knight. He's like, oh, is that right? And he, 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 I love it. And this is a good technique. You might want to check it out. He answers the question with a question. Pro tip. Just, just ask him a question. Verse three, Jesus answered them with a question. What, well, what did Moses say in the law about divorce? I love it. Well, what did Moses say? Because remember, he's talking to the Jewish religious leaders at the time who they said, whatever Moses says goes. He's like, well, what did Moses say? Verse four, well, and I don't underline this in my Bible. He permitted it. Can you underline that in your Bible? He permitted it, they replied. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and then send her away. Just kick her to the curb, boot her. But Jesus responded, oh, this is so good. He wrote this commandment only as a concession to what? To your, oh my goodness. We could just, y'all just wanna go home? Can I just tell you, the number one reason why marriages fail, I'll tell you it all day long, is pride. P-R-D-E. What's in the middle? I, well, I think you should treat me like this. Well, I think I, Every single time, it's about sex, it's about money, it's about this, it's about that, it's, it's about I. I want you to do, and you didn't do what for me. I, 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 I. I was looking up the word for hard heart in the Bible, and it's a Greek word scleros, where we get our like multiple sclerosis, and it's the hardening of arteries. I was like, oh my goodness, that's me. That is me. I'm the, I'm the chief of pride. Any, any great leaders in here? Raise your hand. Like, you're stubborn. You're prideful. Like, what do we need to do? <laughs> right? Just this week, this last week, I'm in, I'm in Mexico, amigos. I mean, Cinco de Mayo, by the way. Muy bien. Vamos. Dude, I'm in. I'm, I'm with a mentor. I'm about to have this amazing trip with my mentor. We're going through a book called Practicing the Way of Jesus. I mean, it's amazing. And we're getting some groceries the day before. My wife happens to be there too. And we're in the grocery store. And you know when you go to the grocery store and you're in line and there's people behind you and then all of a sudden your wife's like, hey, I gotta go get to something. Like what? Now you start sweating because you're like, I hope she gets back by the time I actually am able to pay for it. And... And I don't know what it is. She, it's like, she's like, wants to throw the Hail Mary. Like every time we're at the grocery store, you know, it's like, and she comes, you know, and I had just, pay, you know, you had just, the debit card just, just went in and you're, <laughs> and I'm like, D money, what's up, man? Like, and I, I'll just be honest with you. I just need to confess this. I was so rude to my wife. I, there was no reason for me to be rude to my wife. I'm being sarcastic, you know, and she brings like a chocolate bar. She was like, I'm like a chocolate bar. What are we doing here? You know what she was doing? She was trying to find my favorite cereal for me and she couldn't find it. I'm like, rude is all get out. Everybody say pride. Pride. Here she was trying to serve me. Here's the thing. Let me just say, you stack up another one, another one, another one, and another one without some humility and forgiveness, another one, another one. Guess what? Now it's like this huge, hard heart and I'll never forget early on in my ministry career, before we had a building, before we, we were in Kiewit Middle School. You know where my office was? In my mommy's basement. I'll never forget it. A couple asked to meet with me. And by the way, I, I don't meet with like either a guy or a girl about their marriage problems. I meet with both of them. 
so I can get both sides of the story. Takes two to tango. And I never forget, I met with this couple, sweet couple. But I saw the sclerosis. And this poor gentleman was lost. He was disconnected from God for many years. And he was angry and bitter and resentful and mean. And the wife looked at me, and because the first question I always ask is, do you believe that God can perform a miracle in your marriage? If he can do that, if you can believe, God can do it. If one or both spouses say no, many times, it's, it's, it's done. And I looked at both of them, and the man said, I am, I just came to Christ. I can't believe how I've treated my wife this many years. I cannot believe it. I believe, though, that if she will forgive, God can restore her marriage. And I looked at the wife, and I said, how do you feel about it? She said, I'm done. I can't. A couple years later, I saw they, were, they had young people in our ministry, and I saw her working at a, a restaurant. They had split. It just breaks your heart. What was it? Pride. It's not understanding God's best for our life how marriage works, and now the hardening of hearts happens. And Jesus is leaning in, and he's saying, listen, Moses, what did he do? He permitted it. And that's your first, if you're a note taker. He first says, Moses, what Moses permitted. He, he zones in on this. And it just breaks my heart when I, when I look at this, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's me. Now, by God's grace, I, I early right away in Mexico, in Spanish, lo siento, mi, mi amor. Can you, that's, that's, forgive me, please. Or I'm sorry. And she's so good. Thank you, babe, for your grace, your patience. Moses permitted it. He didn't command it. Now, the whole text that they're talking about you can jot it down, it's in Deuteronomy 24. And it's an interesting passage, it's in the Jewish law. And so again, what Moses wrote down is, man, this, God said it, we believe it, we're gonna do it. But here's the text, I'll read it for you, Deuteronomy 24, verse one. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because she, he has found some, and this is the word, uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house. And the question, the, the, here was the big question. What is uncleanness? What's the actual grounds for divorce? And so that's why they're asking this question. It's not just a political trap, it's a theological trap as well. Because in that day, there were two, basic two, two ways to look at uncleanness. There was a guy named, um, I think it's Rabbi Shemai. And Rabbi Shammai, everybody say Shammai, hopefully that's right. And this dude took uncleanness as anything like sexual immorality, adultery. If that, that, that's the term, the actual term I think is pornea, where we get our, our word today, pornography, and it was this, there's just sexual immorality. So this uncleanness, if this happens, now, you, now, now we're good, like you, you, can, you can do that. And so, but then there was another Rabbi, in his movement, it actually was the predominant theme on divorce in that day because women, they just had a poor outlook on women in that day. And that was Rabbi Hillel. Rabbi Hillel and his whole posse was like, man, if she burned my breakfast, I can, boot, I can kick her to the curb. No favor in her. Or if I like someone else, maybe looks a little bit hotter. Isn't that interesting how that happens, right? Don't... If we don't water our own grass, the grass is always greener on the other side. And now, oh, what if I had her? What if I had him? And that was like legal. So the Pharisees are trying to get Jesus trapped up theologically in what camp that Jesus was gonna put himself in. Ooh, and then Jedi, Jedi Jesus is like, no, nah, y'all ain't gonna do that to me. Which, by the way, let me, before I even go further, jot down Matthew 19, eight and nine, because in that text, Jesus um, 
talks about this idea of uncleanness and he says that it's, it's all due to adultery. If it's, if it's sexual immorality, that is a grounds for divorce. He says it right in, in the text. Okay, golly, there's so much to this. Before I go any further, I just wanted to give me a 30 second time out real quick and just say this. Because even Jesus would allow divorce for couples that have gone through sexual immorality and adultery doesn't mean he commanded it. So let me, this is why I need to say this. I, some of my best friends right now have tragically made bad decisions and gone outside of their marriage sexually, but in a miracle way, their wives have chosen to forgive them and stay in it. And I would tell you, I, I could list five of them Three of them are the best marriages I know around me to this day. Because why? They leaned in. They're like, I, they're like you know what? I'm going to trust God to do a miracle in my heart of forgiveness. I'm not saying you have. I'm just saying don't just immediately move forward. Maybe God could do a miracle in your heart. Let me also say this because I see it all the time. Paul, how, how many? The, great, the best defense is a good offense. So can I just give you something from Paul a little bit just on this whole idea of sex? I talk, we talked this about this last year. I wanna give it to you again, jot it down. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15. If you are married here and you wanna do all you can to make sure there's no enemy coming to destroy your marriage, here's a great way to protect your marriage. You ready? It's God through the apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, chapter seven, verse 15. If the, wife, if the husband and the wife who isn't, oh, excuse me, that's not right. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Where is it at? Do you guys got it for me? There it is. Nope, that's not it. Oh, there it is. 1 Corinthians 7. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Verse 3. Jot it down. Oh, this is so good. The husband, where my husbands, just wave at me real quick. Okay. Husbands, husbands. Okay. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. And the church said... Amen. Okay. And the wife should fill her husband's needs. Verse four, watch this now. Come on now. This is, this is so impactful right now. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. Did you know he, she gives authority over her body to her husband? And the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Mama, you're all, I'm, I'm all yours. My, my mentor, Pastor Steve, I always ask him about that. He'd be like, yeah, don't say it. Okay, never mind. I'll keep on going. <laughs> He's in heaven like, dude, like, say it. <laughs> Verse five. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Ready? Here we go. Verse five, church. Do not deprive. Do not starve. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless... You both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Some of us just need to write it down in our notes, go back and prayerfully read that, and I would just lovingly say, discuss it as a couple. What does that mean in our season of life? It's not headlock, it's not you have to, get over here. It's all that weird stuff that people try to put on the church, forgive us if that's the call. It's not that. It is I'm going to serve the Lord by serving my wife. And my wife is gonna serve the Lord by serving me. God gave us these needs. He pre-programmed us and, and he gave you and I the way how these needs are met in a pure and powerful and God-honoring way. And when we operate in God's best, guess what, man? You can sit here. You know, tomorrow I celebrate 24 years with my wife by God's grace. 24 years. And it's only all glory to God. And I, I haven't been perfect, but I can tell you this, man. Like it... How do I say this in a loving way? Like my, 
God can change your heart and your trajectory of your marriage, your family, and the generations to come by one decision you can make today. I promise you, and this might be the one area that you need help with. Don't give up. Seek the Lord. Seek help. Let God change it. Now, number one is what Moses permitted. Number two, but what I love how Jesus does it. He goes back to what God originally intended. It's so good. Verse six, but God made them male and female. I want you to underline that in your Bible. This is Jesus talking. This isn't the culture talking. This isn't Todd talking. This is Jesus, the Christ, the God man, speaking to us as human beings right now, all countries, all nations. He's saying God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. He was citing Genesis chapter one when he made the world. Verse 27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. What is it, church? Male and female, he created them. Listen now, there are some things we just do not choose. And I gotta say this very tactfully because if you're struggling with your identity sexually right now, I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what abuse, I don't know what confusion, I don't know why you're in this place right now. So I am not gonna come from an ivory tower and say, you know, point my finger at you. All I'm gonna do is point my finger to God's word and ask that you would at least consider reconsidering what God says in his word and what is his best is for your life. That's all I'm really saying on this topic. But it, it, this is God's word. This is not Todd's word. He made us male and female. And this is wild. This is what he says in, in verse seven. So good. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. <laughs> I, uh, okay, I know I'm kind of lame, but uh, here's D-Money right here. She's pink. It says female. I, I should have put D-Money on it, but I'm like, I wanted y'all to be with it. And there's me, I'm the male. My nickname in college was Kermit, so I thought I'd get a green one. Uh, why do I show you this? Because this word, they're, they're, they're joined together by God. They're, they're united into one. Since they are no longer two, but they are, they're one. They're one together. Since they're no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Listen, what was God's intention for marriage to be intimate, joined together, and permanent? Let no one separate it. Intimate and permanent. I heard a preacher say, leave, we, or leave, cleave, and weave. I was looking up this word for joined, and of course, because I'm a Greek major, it is, uh, no, I'm just joking with you, but, but it's powerful. Proskoleo. You want to say that one? Proskoleo. All right. And it means to glue upon, to glue to, to join oneself closely, to cleave to, to stick to. And what I would just say, be very careful what spouse you stick to. Make sure you're getting stuck with the right spouse. Equally stuck. The message version for verse nine says this, because God created this organic union of the two sexes, no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. And so I was just, I was like, man, this is, this is it. They're joined together. I got a... Uh, I, got, I bought some Gorilla Glue, too. How many love super glue here at church today? Super glue can just fix anything, right? It's like darn shoe, that little part. Just, just put a little, little, little Gorilla Glue on that thing. So yesterday, in my study time, God said, go get some Gorilla Super Glue, some Spirit Glue. We got the Spirit Glue, and, and he said, go ahead and super glue some pieces of paper together. 
I want you to teach the church what marriage is all about. <laughs> Jesus' name. <laughs> what tragically happens, Mike, can you maybe help me with this? Like, when people or pride or whatever, like, what happens when we, oh, no. Wait, but, hey, we're going to get a divorce, but it's not going to be all that bad. It really won't affect anybody. I mean, the kids, they'll get, they'll, they'll, they're, they're resilient, those kids. Oh, for Pete's sake. Mike, I thought we were going to do this where it, Mike's like, when do I sit down? <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Give it up for Pastor Mike O'Connell, one of my best friends. And as I, I mentioned in the beginning, I am not showing this to shame or to blame or to hurt. What I'm doing is showing this because I really believe there's a couple of people here, that there's younger people right now and you have an opportunity, am I gonna do life God's way or am I gonna do it my way? And there are marriages right now that they are still together by God's grace, but they're hanging on by a thread. And they have a choice right now, what am I gonna do? Join together. God's gorilla glue, his spirit, his scriptures, his word. There's some, isn't there something profound about when we come together? When D-Money and I came together, we just fit together. It's so wild. And then we have twins. It was so wild, man. Like, it's so cool to see the kids grow up. You see, isn't it wild? You see in your kids, you see like, you know, both of you and both of your kids. <laughs> and for whatever reason, my kids get like my negative qualities. I'm like, great. And they get all her great qualities. I'm like, what the heck happened here, you know? I just think, man. Us as humans, he creates us. He gives us free will. He's like, man, this is my best for your life. My word, my word, my word. I, I'm, I, I started off in Genesis 1, sorry, to show you how life works. But so many of us are like, yeah, it's archaic. I'm, times have changed. It's what you think. Whatever feels good, do it. And it breaks my heart. Can you imagine God's heart? It breaks his heart. He's like, oh man, I set this up. I created you. I know how it works. I know how marriage works, man. Which by the way, if you're, uh, if you're here, you're like, man, I need some marriage help. I'll give you one verse. You ready for it? Ephesians 5.33. This will, this will change your marriage if you apply it by the power of God's spirit. Paul said to the church in Ephesus in chapter five, verse 33. So again, I say, each man must, what, love? Everybody say love. love. And that is agape. Men, that is not just when they're like pretty good to you and they're serving you and everything's great. It is unconditional love. When it's that time of the month, yes, love her, any, love her right then. When, when she's like just nagging at you, like I know none of your wives do, but and in the case of some maybe that maybe do, guess what? You... I love you, baby. <laughs> when you don't feel like doing something, just do it anyways by the power of God. Just the other day, we were reading the Bible together. We, we, were, we were about to read the Bible together. And uh, she looks at me, she's like, I, my Bible's in my office. I'm like, you got two legs, man. Like, what's up? Like, <laughs> and so I go into her office I'm scouring through the office, no Bible. She's like, oh, I forgot. It's in the car. <laughs> Once again, you can probably get a good workout going down there, coming back up on the stairs, right? So that, I'm just telling you the eternal conversation I'm having, the, like the internal conversation, I guess, and eternal, bo both happening. I looked at her, I'm like, yeah, no problem, babe. I got her like, you know, backpack, I'm bringing it up. I promise you, she looked at me, she, I, she, you would have thought I saved the world. 
you are such a servant of the most high God. Thank you for bringing my fresh manna for the day. Yeah, no problem, babe. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, no, no. That wasn't in my heart. My heart was like, bring me my breakfast, get your own Bible. I'm just trying to wake up. But what is that? P R P R I T. The last thing that I'll do, and I, I have way more in here, but I gotta scratch the whole part, but I'm gonna end with the last point, okay? Because we have Jesus responding what Moses permitted, what God intended, but I'm gonna ask you a question to end, but what have you decided? What have I decided? And by God's grace, I'm gonna just tell you my answer. However dicey it gets, I have decided for better or worse, richer or poor, in sickness and in health, no matter what happens, by God's grace, my, my answer is yes. I'm staying in it. As hard as it gets, I'm staying in. God hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorcees. He hates divorce. Why? Because he wants godly children. He wants to see a nation change through our homes of actually discipling our children in the ways of God. We are staying together. I don't care what happens. There was a woman that was caught in the act of adultery in John chapter eight. And those darn Pharisees, while Jesus was teaching, did the same darn thing trying to trap them up. And they came to Jesus. We found this chick. She was caught in the middle of adultery. By the way, they just bring the woman. They don't bring the dude. And, he, and they say, Jesus, the law says we need to stone her. And not with stones, real stones, okay? Stone her. <laughs> Sorry. And, and Jesus looks, he looks at him. Dude, so, again, Jedi. Everybody say Jedi. He's just, just absolute Jedi. He's like, was that right? It's down on his knees. He's looking at all these homies, these Pharisees, all the church leaders. Should we stone her? I can't wait to stone her. He looks at him. A lot of scholars submit he starts writing down the secret sins of all these church leaders. The Bible says, one by one, from oldest to youngest, they begin to depart. Because what does he say? Y'all without sin? Cool, man. Throw the first stone. One by one, they start piecing out. And Jesus looks at this woman. Can you imagine the, the embarrassment and the shame? And he looks at her, he says, now, where did your accusers go? He said, Jesus, they're gone. And then what did Jesus say to her? I could just picture him. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Go and sin no more. We get it off. We, we say, well, Jesus can, you can do whatever you want. I don't condemn you. Go and do whatever you want. No, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Why? Because some of you guys went through a divorce, but guess what? Oh, this is good news, and I'm going to end here. <laughs> By God's grace and with the glue, he can restore all things new and put you back together. I wanted to actually put the glue in, but I ran out of time. But can I give someone good news right now? You can come back together and be brand new. Father, thank you for this word. We do pray. By your grace, would you heal, restore, convict, don't condemn, convict. Lord, we pray, God, for just grace to flow, decisions to be made, from this day forward, no more. We're not even gonna entertain
this nasty D word. We understand it's not my spouse, it's the enemy of my soul trying to wreck everything. And we say no. And this is really all for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and for the sake of time, I wanna just do something a little bit different. In this private moment, if you don't happen, have to absolutely be gone right now, I just invite you to stay for the last two, three, four minutes. You might be here today and the bottom line is you need forgiveness and maybe it's not for some of this that we're talking about when it comes to marriage and divorce, but it's just different areas of your life that you've fallen short. The Bible is very clear, God is perfect, we aren't. We're on the same boat. But the good news of Jesus is God's like, man, I don't wanna be disconnected from my people forever. I wanna come down on this rescue mission and that's what Jesus did. Born of the Virgin Mary, 33 years of absolute perfection. And when they were taking up stones and they were gonna kill Jesus, Jesus, the perfect lamb slain before the foundation of the world, he was pinned to that cross, brutally murdered, so I don't have to. In our simple but profound step of faith, God, I can't do it. I have blown it, and I believe, Jesus, you paid for it. Man, I'm telling you, it's the greatest news ever. If you need forgiveness today, today's the day. In the moment the band's gonna play, your opportunity to come forward and say yes to Jesus. I've talked too long. You know that you're, you need to be, you might be here for the first time. It might be third, fourth, fifth time. And you know we're about to do this. And you're like, man, today's my day. You come forward as the band plays. I'll lead you in a prayer. God, open up my heart. I invite you inside. This is for you online as well. Make today the day of your salvation. Amen. So church, begin to pray. Band, go ahead and play. If that's you, you come forward. You come forward right now.